The month of January is devoted to the most holy name of Jesus. And so with this in mind, let us consider this reflection upon that name that is above every other name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. The immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Paul writes in one of his letters the following, quote, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of the Father. In one part of the Old Testament, we find that the Israelites lose a major military battle to the pagan Philistines. Not only have many of God's people died in this battle, but also the precious Ark of the Covenant with its holy contents fell into the hands of the enemy. And so the Philistines triumphantly marched back to one of their main cities and placed the Ark of the Covenant into a pagan temple dedicated to their demonic god known as Dagon. Confident in their recent victory over the Israelites, the Philistines put the Ark right next to a sculpted idol of Dagon, as if the God of Israel were somehow subject to the God of the Philistines. But on rising from their beds the next morning, the pagan priests of the Philistines found that the statue of Dagon in the temple was toppled over and lying on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines soon re-erected the statue of Dagon only to find that it fell a second time before the ark, with this time the hands and head of the idol breaking off in the process. The true God and his holy ark had ventured into the darkness of a pagan temple, dwelling amongst a pagan people, and demonstrated his almighty power by having all other gods bow, bend, and even break before him. You know, within two weeks of Christmas Day and his royal birth, our dearest Lord Jesus Christ received royal visitors from pagan nations who fell prostrate before him, giving him gifts, three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, symbolizing his kingship, his divinity, his priesthood, and also his martyrdom. Soon afterwards, good St. Joseph would take the Son of God and Son of Mary and would flee into the pagan land of Egypt in order to escape the rage of King Herod and the bloody massacre of the Holy Innocents. The common opinion of most holy men states that the divine child entered into the darkness of pagan Egypt and dwelt in exile there for some seven years. The divine child had come to the Jews first, but as they would largely reject him and even persecute him unto death, he would now go over to the pagans, to the Gentiles, as the Ark of the New Covenant, into that idolatrous land of Ham. And fulfilling prophecy, the divine child, who is the son of justice, would find a home in the Egyptian city known as Heliopolis, or the city of the sun, the sun that's up in the sky. The prophet Isaiah clearly stated that, quote, an altar of the Lord will be set up in the midst of the land of Egypt, and that numerous cities in the land of Ham would come to the Lord, and that one of them, one of those cities, should be called the city of the sun, unquote ancient Heliopolis, where the city of the sun in Egypt had a temple complex 
that was devoted to the sun god known as Amon Ra. Heliopolis was the religious and spiritual center of the land of Egypt. And the people there practiced an abominable form of idolatry, sacrificing deformed children, and even thinking it a special act of piety to offer healthy ones to be sacrificed. Besides this, the Egyptians practice obscene rituals in secret. In the temple dedicated to Amun Ra, again the sun god, one could see some 350 stone idols. And each of these idols received its own daily honors and rituals through the ministry of pagan priests. But the ancient literary sources tell us that this pagan temple would soon receive a visit from the Christ child and the Holy Family. The Blessed Virgin Mary and Good Saint Joseph went into the temple with the divine infant. And immediately, all the Egyptian idols prostrated themselves upon the ground so that all of them were lying on their faces, shattered and broken to pieces. This devastating fall of the idols plainly showed that they were nothing before the true God. And this true event of the fall of the idols before the Ark of the New Covenant was the fulfillment once again of the prophecy of Isaiah. The prophet wrote, quote, Behold, the Lord will come upon a swift cloud and will enter Egypt, and all the handiwork, all the idols of the Egyptians shall be moved at his presence, unquote. Some Egyptians, including the pagan high priest, converted on the spot and fell before the divine child in worship. Furthermore, even the governor of the city of the sun acknowledged the true God. An ancient text stated the following, quote, The governor of the city, when news was brought to him, went to the temple of the sun with all his army. And the pagan ministers of the temple thought that the governor was making haste to seek vengeance on those on whose account the idols had fallen down. But when the governor came into the temple and saw all the idols lying prostrate on their faces, he went up to the blessed Mary, who was carrying the Lord in her bosom, and he adored the child and said to all his army and all his friends, unless this were the God of our gods, our gods would not have fallen their faces before him nor would they be lying prostrate in his presence. Wherefore, these fallen idols silently confess that this child is their Lord, unquote. But others were not so open. Others became angry and formed a vengeful mob that sought the death of the Holy Family. Another ancient tradition tells us that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph found refuge under a sycamore tree whose branches covered the Holy Family and hid them from the violent crowd. Well, to this very day, one can see evidence of the devastation of the idols and that former city of Heliopolis. An enormous field of fallen idols can still be seen where hundreds of pagan statues lie fallen idolatrous pillars, the circumference of huge oak trees are toppled over. Heads of stone, pharaohs the size of automobiles are broken off and lying next to their own stone feet. Statues of shapely stone queens can be found lying on their sides, toppled over. Archaeologists find themselves walking through a field of rubble, unable to find a single stone monument standing or intact on this ancient site. One modern archeologist remarked that the site looked like a stone age junkyard. But while all the idols fell, the Christ child and the Holy Family built up the belief and worship of the true God while in Egypt. It is recorded that the Blessed Mother instructed heathen women in the true faith and encourage them to lead a life of virtue. And according to the great Trinitarian theologian, St. Hilary, St. Joseph acted as an apostle 
amongst the pagan Egyptians, evangelizing those in darkness by his teaching and excellent example. And though his major public miracles would not begin until the wedding feast at Cana, it is well known that the divine infant healed many sick people in Egypt. This month, this month of January, we remember the most holy name of Jesus. This holy name was given to the divine child by his heavenly father, and it was especially bestowed on him at his circumcision, which took place on the octave or the eighth day after his nativity. As the gospel records, quote, and after eight days were accomplished, the child should be circumcised. His name was called Jesus. As many saints have told us, the Eternal Father desired to reward the humility, the infinite condescension of his Son by giving him so wondrous a name. Yes, while Jesus humbles himself, receiving the mark of a sinner on his sacred body, it is right and just that his Heavenly Father should honor him by giving him a name that is above every other name. And God the Father demands and commands that this most holy name should be adored by angels, men, and even the devils and all the damned below. For St. Paul writes, quote, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, unquote. Is it that the holy name given to the sacred humanity of Jesus Christ is to be adored? Of course due to the mystery of the incarnation, due to the mystery of the hypostatic or personal union between a divine person and humanity. This holy name is literally a divine name. It's the name of the Son of God who became flesh for our salvation. By speaking and, yes, worshiping the name of Jesus, the entire majesty of our Lord is adored. It is only right and just, therefore, that we ought to bow our heads at the very mention of this holy name, and men should remove their hats whenever and wherever the divine name is spoken. If we do not bow before him and his holy name, then we shall be toppled like those idols and the demons behind them, for all must bow before him, either voluntarily or involuntarily. Either we willingly bend, or we will be struck with an iron rod that will force us to bend. The name of the Son of God and Son of Man is most powerful, and it's able to defend us from the greatest assaults, the idols of lust, sensuality, materialism, scientism, the ideology, avarice, pride, and all the demonic vices are toppled before him and fall before the one who but utters the divine name with faith. By reciting the most holy name of the Son of God and Son of Mary, we will become a temple of the Lord truly. Because he will come into the temple of our bodies, into the sanctuaries of our souls, as the Ark of the New Covenant, and all ungodliness and vice will be toppled. I will now end this particular reflection on the holy name of Jesus with quotations from St. Alphonsus Liguori, the great doctor of the church, patron of moral theology, great founder, the redemptorist, great bishop. He wrote this about the holy name, quote, God the Father has given him a name that is so great and powerful that it is venerated in heaven, on earth, and in hell. A name powerful in heaven because it can obtain all graces for us, powerful on earth because it can save all who invoke it with devotion, and powerful in hell because this name makes all the devils tremble. He continues, these rebel angels tremble at the sound of that most holy and sacred name, because they remember that Jesus Christ was the mighty one who destroyed the dominion and power they had before 
over men. Again, St. Alphonsus continues, our Savior himself said that through this powerful name, his disciples should cast out devils. And in fact, the church in her exorcisms always makes use of this name in driving out the infernal spirit from those who are possessed. And priests who are assisting dying persons call to their aid the name of Jesus to deliver them from the assaults of hell, which at the last moment are so terrible. See, Peter says that there is no other name given to us by which we can find salvation but this ever-blessed name of Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given to men where we must be saved. And finally, a quotation again from St. Alphonsus Liguori. Jesus is he who has not only saved us once for all, but he continually preserves us from the danger of sin by his merits each time we invoke him with confidence. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, that will I do. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Amen.